Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Project Management Paradise podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Murphy, and today I'm joined by Jeff Hopkins to discuss the five tips to accelerate digital transformation. Jeff is Honeywell's Global Program Management Office Leader and is responsible for their end-to-end project solutions processes. He also serves as the Program Management Office Leader for Honeywell Integrated. Prior to joining Honeywell, Jeff held R&D roles at Procter & Gamble Company across multiple regions and business segments. He is the industry leader in driving enterprise-wide digitally enabled work process transformation. Jeff, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you. To get things started, can you tell us about yourself and your background? Yeah, so I I think you you covered, I'm currently the Global Program Management Office Leader for Honeywell, as well as the Integrated uh, PMO uh, Leader. I've been in that role, been at Honeywell for about three years, and prior to that was at Procter & Gamble, driving a lot of uh, work process transformation in the R&D and manufacturing and regulatory space. Uh, you know, I'm a chemical engineer by training, but, uh, you know, I've always been very interested in in the digital side of things and so kind of gravitated over to uh, to that area over time. That's fantastic. And can you explain to us a little bit about the two hats that you wear at Honeywell? Yeah, it, so the Global Program Management Office uh, leader role is a, is a new role. Um, and... You know, it's it's really to uh, optimize uh, about eleven and a half billion dollars worth of project solutions business. So we've we've focused it on project solutions to start, um, and and spans those businesses. And and we want to optimize the performance of those to drive the profitability of those businesses by uh, standardizing on work process by um, pro- you know digitally enabling those work processes with, you know, enterprise-wide capabilities, but also importantly, investing in building the future DNA and program management and controls by developing the the capabilities and and skill set of our employee base. And then for Intelligrated, you know, so it's it's kind of been interesting because we've got that kind of horizontal role at the corporate level, but then I'm deeply embedded in one of the businesses, one of the the most important um, project solutions businesses you know, to see the 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 real day to day challenges of operating that business, the opportunities that are there, and you know, then I, I like to tell my my peers in the other um, you know uh, project solution businesses that hey, I you know I, I from a corporate standpoint, I've got to eat my own dog food, so to speak. So it 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 forces you to really think you know closely around hey, is what we're going to be driving out here is it value add? What's the real kind of practical challenges with implementing it down into a business? So I think it's it's helped keep me kind of grounded as well as get a uh, you know more in-depth experience in this uh in this business model. Absolutely. And for example, could you just give a, uh, an overview of maybe some of the typical programs and projects that you do manage at Honeywell? Are they all the same or is there complete different projects happening at the same time? Yeah, I I mean first I would say that um because it speaks a bit to the transformation that we're driving and why we're putting together, you know, the GPMO is you know, if you look at the external environment that we're operating in, uh, it's. It, I think most leaders would tell you that it's the most challenging, if not, you know, at least one of the most challenging, you know, environments that that have ever had to operate in. Right. So, starting with the the, the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic, uh, flowing right from that crisis into uh, you know global supply chain shortages, into inflation. You have the the war in Ukraine um, uh, with with Russia, where you've got companies that are needing to get out of their operations in Russia. They're needing to protect and and care for their employees in in the in in that area, uh, and then certainly leading into everyone's concern about this winter in Europe and and you know what's that going to mean to be able to operate a business? What's that going to mean for our people? You know, very very challenging environment, and so. You know, in the GPMO, it's really about then recognizing that in, um, you know, whenever there's big disruption like that, it also creates the opportunity for innovation. It creates the, you know, when the when the weather is really rough and and the and the the uh, the water is choppy, the best, uh, you know, captain and the best crew tend to prevail in a race. And so, you know, investing into that storm to you know, uh, raise the bar on our performance um, as a project solutions business and really optimize that, um, not just to weather the storm, but to then outpace our competition 
is a is a really really great opportunity. So a lot of the GPMO efforts are focused there. So how do we standardize the um, you know the way that we're doing the work, uh, deploying an enterprise uh, ecosystem to to manage these projects? And and to to your question, maybe your direct question, the the types of projects we work on are exceptionally diverse across the the business. So in in Intelligrated, it's it's warehouse automation and you know, these projects can range from, um, you know, a couple million dollars of, of uh, upgrades that you're doing over a weekend to, you know, over a hundred million dollar projects that might last, you know, 18 months or even even two years, depending on kind of when you start the clock. Uh, and then we have our Honeywell um, building solutions. Uh, we'll do a lot of, um, you know, integrated systems for buildings, so security and fire. Uh, again, smaller projects all the way up to 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 quite big projects there. Uh, in our um, UPT organization, they play in the oil and gas industry. So again, very diverse range of projects there. Um, we have our projects uh, process solutions businesses, uh, and they're dealing, again, with a very broad range of types of projects, the geographies they're dealing with. Um, and then our, our aero organization and our smart energy organization kind of rounded out. Um, so quite a diverse kind of customer base, a diverse business model, a diverse geography. So very, very different, um, but all unified around this vision that we need to raise the bar on how we're operating those projects to optimize the performance of those businesses. That's fantastic. And bringing in digital transformation really will help uh, connect them all essentially, especially when they're large projects, probably over multiple years, as you did mention. And just on the topic of digital transformation, what are the pitfalls that you would normally encounter when it comes to implementing digital transformation into a company? I think it's a great question. And, and it's really the focus of my of, of my talk. You know, when, um, when, when people talk digital transformation, they tend to get very focused on the tool and, you know, it's this tool or that tool, and it's all about implementing the tool. Um, but I heard a great analogy, um, you, you know, that, that speaks to what I think is the biggest challenge, which is around the people side of change. And this now analogy was um, that, you, you know, digital transformation is like the, the cyclone in the Wizard of Oz. It, it, you know, it rolls through, it tears everything up, it picks you up and it plops you down in this new world that's so very foreign and very different to you from a, you know, from an end user point of view, right? And, and, and actually from a leader of, of those users as well, because their life changes quite a bit. Uh, and I think it's a great analogy, because if you think about um, Wizard of Oz was the first color movie, you know, back in 1939, and that transition from Kansas and black and white to Oz and color, you know, I think is very indicative of kind of what we see of, of going from a world where you're in, you know, email and spreadsheets to, you know, to a world where you, your data is more democratized and you can access it and leverage it more. Um, but but if you really kind of dig into this, right, um, the 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 cyclone was it was critical to the movie, but it, it, the movie wasn't about the cyclone. The movie was about um, Dorothy's journey to Oz and, and learning to fall in love with Oz, right? And usually people here will stop me and say, that's a terrible analogy. The whole movie was about Dorothy's desire to get back to Kansas. Like, well, yeah. you're supposed to be talking about transformation and the whole point of that movie was she was trying to get back to Kansas. And I think that's a very real you know, thing that we all deal with in, when driving transformation is people want to go back to their old way of working, right? But what a lot of people don't know is that movie was the first in a series of 12 books. Um, and, and the rest of those books detail journeys, uh, Dorothy's journey to get back to Oz because she realizes once she's back in Kansas, that's not where she wants to be. And I think tra digital transformation is, is very much like that. So once you get people over and they're and they're really set up and operational in the new world, nobody wants to go back to the to the old world, right? They get um, once they're proficient and they're capable. So uh, um, it it raises the question of kind of what what do our people need to successfully navigate that transformation, right? right. And so con continuing with the analogy a little bit, if you if you'll uh, let me continue with the analogy, right? Is um, if you think about the the movie, right? Dorothy was helped by by three people, right? So the you had the scarecrow, the tin man, and the uh, and the lion, mm -hmm. and the you know if you if you kind of play off the analogy a little bit more, the the scarecrow was looking for his brain, and so this speaks to, you know, we need to 
Um, you know, we need to tra train our people. We need to educate them. And training and education are two different things because training is kind of, okay, push this button, do this, do that. Education is more the why behind why we're doing it and, and what we want to get out of it. And the Tin Man was looking for his heart. And so the, the heart represents the, the passionate belief that this transformation that you're driving is critical, not just for the company to survive, but for the company to thrive. And then the one that really resonates with people is the line was looking for courage, right? And this is the, the courage to, to get started and the courage to keep going when the going gets tough because this these, you know, these uh, progress and these transformations is often uneven. And so my first kind of tip that I'll, I'll share in the Project Controls Symposium is, you know, find your lions, uh, feed your lions, and that's as opposed to feed them to the lions, which is what sometimes happens, uh, and, and be a lion yourself. Right. And, and so and, and I'll share a video in the project controls, you know, I'll, I'll find these folks that are um, really embracing what we're doing and I'll put them on a pedestal and I'll put them out in front to talk to their peers, either, you know, directly or, or in some videos. So I use a lot of video to do that. So I'll share a video that we just recently put together about our core transformation, you know, in the in the project control symposium. Fantastic. Awesome. I, I won't be able to look at that film the same way now without thinking of digital transformation after our conversation. So thank you very much. And as you mentioned, it's uh, the people can be very important when it comes to the change. So can you kind of elaborate a little maybe more on how you got the people side of change? Why is it so important how to get them on board with this, whether it's through implementing the software to help with the digital transformation or really to educate? Like, how is this important? Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a you need a multifaceted approach and and the kind of the second tip that I'll probably spend a little bit more time on and I've got some kind of visuals to support it is um, we've developed this um, I call it the the V model um, for for transformation and and it's very much focused around a go live but it's a it's a bit of a um, uh, it, you know you you can use it throughout because you're obviously probably going to go have multiple mo go lives on your journey um but if you if I, if you look at the driving transformation i believe that you need to drive transformation on three levels and you have to have a management operating system um around driving that transformation on all three levels uh and and that's along with like a, a cadence of how you connect uh who you connect with the kpis that you're measuring you know, all of those things have to come together. And, and so those three groups are, you have to, um, obviously you have to engage senior leadership and, and senior leadership needs to commit the resources that are going to be required to do it. Um, they got to define that it's a priority um, and they have to um, commit to a date that they're going to get it done by because otherwise these things just kind of shift to the right because um, uh, change is hard and we all have very busy lives uh, in our day to day. So putting time aside to transform is very difficult. So you, they, that group has really got to hold to those three things. You know, we're committing the resources. This is a priority. And, and then we want it done by the state. And they got to drive that down in their organizations. And then on the other end is you've got the end users. And, and, and it's interesting because the motivation between the two is very different, right? The senior leaders, they're worried about what's right for the company. And the users are, are worried about what does this mean for me and my day-to-day, -day, you know, role. And, and in that user group, you're going to have, I, I find this kind of bell curve of innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards is 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 very real. Uh, and it's something that you, you, you see. And, and so for that group, I think um, there's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, so one is you, you need to provide training and you need to provide education and um, depending on, and it's interesting, depending on the function and depending on the culture, you may need to just spend the time on the what, or you might need to spend the time on the why to get them there. And I think that's something you have to kind of figure out with your audience. Are they kind of compliant and they'll go along and because they've been told to, or are they going to, you know, give you lip service and then just keep doing what they're doing, you know, for, um, and without really uh, embracing the transformation. Um, and then I think on the other side is you have to measure utilization. Um, and so we've been, you know, pulling some backend data 
um, and in uh, looking at how like how many times are people logging in, you know, how much time are they spending in the different tool? Where in the tool are they going? So we're we're working to extract good analytics out of the out of the data that we have in the tool to understand how people are using it and maybe where they're struggling, where we need to do additional training or pockets of resistance in different businesses. And then literally, like I'll go through and look at logins. And if I see a PM hasn't logged in in like, um, you know, uh, certainly over a week, I'll call them up personally and be like, hey, um, why haven't you logged in in the past week? And and that like hands-on touch, um, I think it's sometimes shocking to them that they have a VP calling them, asking them why they haven't logged into the tool. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, it gets results because then, you know, then, then they get on the journey. And then I think the most important group is you have to have this third group, which is the um, change network leaders. Because if you're in a corporate role like I am, you know you you, you can't lead an organization through uh, a transformation. The business leaders in that organization have to do that. So these change network leaders are sort of the leaders of, sometimes they're the leaders of the people that are going to be the users. Sometimes they're their peers and we elevate one of them to be the kind of the subject matter expert or change network leader. But they're to make the transformation consumable by their organization. So that's both on making sure the requirements are well understood. So we bake those in, they're involved in the testing so that we ensure that we're meeting those requirements. But then the, the other part of that is the other side of that coin again is now it's you're accountable to drive this in your business. You need to make sure your business leadership is engaged. You need to make sure your users are engaged. You select the right projects um, to, to get started on. So th that approach I think has been like it's worked for me in fast moving consumer goods B2C and it's worked in software industrial B2B. And so I think if you kind of do that right, you can really accelerate your transformation. That's fantastic. So having the right people using the correct tools really does help with the onboarding process of digital transformation. And you've mentioned the software element of this and how does software help with digital transformation at Honeywell? Yeah, I think if you look at the future of work, and and this, this is beyond the program management space, like this is, I, I think this is true, you know, broadly across the domains that we we play in, whether it's in marketing or engineering. I, I think there's two fundamental differences and and changes around the way that we need to work to be um, not just competitive, but to be a leader in our industry, in a, a very, 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 very challenging environment, external environment, right? An internal environment, right? We, we, you know, we have labor challenges just like everybody else does. So um, I think it, it, it plays two important roles in the future of work for me really um, evolves around two fundamental differences. So one is about data. Um, and if you think about the you know, uh, Institute for the Future had a great definition of the world we live in. And this, I think they made this prediction like 10 years ago, and it's certainly proven to be true. And they said that, you know, the world, you know, in the in the foreseeable future is going to be volatile, um, unpredictable, complex and ambiguous. So this VUCA world is the, the term that we use. And certainly that has <laughs> lived up uh, to its billing uh, And so in that in that world, right, the ability to harness your data to better respond to these very complex and ambiguous challenges that hit you is critically important. Uh, and so getting data out of email and, and your processes out of email and spreadsheets and into an enterprise system is absolutely critical uh, to being able to navigate these business challenges um, well. And, and I think you know one of the things Honeywell's done very, very well is managing pricing. And there, it's because we invested in a digital tool to help us manage pricing. So we've been ahead of it better than many of our competitors um, in, in, in managing inflation and taking pricing where we needed to take it to manage inflation, right? Um, in, in the program management world, as we look at um, op, uh, optimizing the performance of these projects, whether it's um, through you know, traditional earned value metrics of you know, SPI, CPI, um, looking at EAC elimination, positive EAC generation, you know, one of the things where I'm personally seeing a lot of value from in our very early days, you know, with Cora is getting all of our risks and opportunities and being able to track all of our change orders that we have with our, our, our customers in one place allows me to uh, understand on a daily basis, I can go in and look at all of our projects 
and I can see, roll that up as a portfolio and I can see, am I, am I seeing, you know, more opportunities than risk? And so I see my profitability improving or am I seeing more risk than opportunities? That's a threat to my profitability. And then, uh, you know, which ones do I need to go mitigate? I can sort them. I can look at um, which are the largest risk. I can look at the ones that have been added in the past week. So as we're doing a weekly touch on the portfolio, I don't have to go email, you know, a hundred you know, different people to go get uh, Excel spreadsheets sent to me that I need to aggregate and and then to, to do that intelligence. I can just log into Quora um, and then open up that dashboard and, and get that uh, intelligence about the portfolio and then go make decisions around, hey, I want to go see this project on Friday in our PM, PMR reviews, or I need to go talk to this PM and understand what's going on about this risk or, you know, or, 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 or. You, you, you see the power of that, that data. And I think the second uh, big change in the future of how we are working and need to be working is to move from a, you know, many work processes in big companies are this handed on process. So, you know, I pass it on from here to here to here to here. And I, I joke that this is the way that you build a World War II spy network where, you know, people know who they got information from and who they pass information to, but it would be far too dangerous for anybody to understand the whole process, right? Mm -hmm. That, that way of working is outdated uh, and we need to be working more concurrently. And so to be working more concurrently, you all have to have the same picture of what's going on. So again, getting things out of email and spreadsheet and into an enterprise system allows people to work more concurrently. So in, in my world, you know, a four in the box, a project engineer, a project controls person. Sometimes we have a dedicated scheduler for the big projects and a program management leader all working together, four in the box around a common view of what's going on in the project, making real-time decisions on how they're going to optimize that project, making real-time decisions to identify and start to mitigate uh, and retire risk. So I think those are the two pieces. And I, I think moving to an enterprise tool and getting out of email and spreadsheets, whether it's a PMIS solution or a PLM or a um, digital twin uh, digital thread kind of setup is is really the future of work um, in the in this space. That's fantastic. And it just provides you with that overview in the one single central location to have all this information that helps power your decisions. And that's going to save you time in the long run, essentially. And if someone was to come to you from a different organization and they're thinking about implementing digital transformation within their company, what five tips would you be able to give them to help accelerate this process? Well, I think to get all five, you'll have to come to the project control symposium, right? So <laughs> I, I've already talked, uh, I've talked to, um, which is, you know, find your lions, feed your lions, be a lion. So this is really, you know, you, you've got to embrace the people that are driving the transformation and, and highlight them and, and recognize that it's, it's not about a tool. It's not about, um, a, you know, a specific piece of software. Uh, it's about the people side of change is what is often kind of left behind. Um, the, you know, the second tip was all around the, the organization construct of, um, you know, how, the three groups that you need to be able to navigate and how you set up a management operating system to engage that group. And then it gets a little bit more like tactical, right? Those are some of the more strategic things. But I, I think another, this this V model construct has been very effective for me. And, and I, I need a picture to explain it. So I'm not going to try to explain it. You know, I think the video for project controls will be posted as well. So I'll have a picture of the V model and I'll, I'll take it, take take folks through that. But that that construct for me has been very effective at, um, uh, at, at, at being successful with the implementations, um, both kind of what you do before you go live and what you do after you go live, the, those very being very deliberate on that um, uh, activity is is important. And then I'd say, you know, the, the fourth and fifth will really round out around, again, some very, you know, practical tips, because the goal for my talk with Project Controls is um, I, I want people to walk away with with five like go difference, uh, do difference on when they they go back in the office on the following Monday. If I do this differently, I'm going to be you know going to be more successful. So one is um, uh, and it's it's a bit of a mindset um, shift, uh, and 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 it may not work for everybody. I'll I'll be open with that, but 
I, I've chosen to um, really approach transformation with a growth mindset and um, and an agile mindset, right? So I, I look at it as uh, rather than do like a big bang. So I, I see a lot of uh, companies that will do this big bang of, well, we're going to go build it all out. And once it's all fully built in a year and a half or two years, then we're going to start to do the, the deployment. And oftentimes I see those those implementations fail or struggle because um, there there wasn't enough understanding of the uh, business requirements uh, up front. And it's not till sometimes you start to really use the tool that you understand in in in, in sufficient detail what your requirements really are, um, or uh, or the organization loses pace, patience or the external environment changes, and so then you know funding gets cut. So I've I and, and we've chosen with the, our core implementation to go in a very agile approach, which is you know where can we extract a value immediately? So my first launch was really about um, risk and opportunity registers, action log, issue log, um, lessons learned, you know, uh, and and basic scheduling, and so getting that th th deployed and and builds a good foundation to kind of build off of going forward. And as we went about that, um, once we we lock on a go live date. I tell my team this, like once you lock on the go live date, then for me, that date's locked and and scope may flow into another release. And, and so we'll do like a major release once a quarter and we, we may add a minor release in the middle of the quarter if we didn't get everything we needed and stuff kind of flew over into the, you know, to the right. But um, I think that's important because, you know, if you get into a rhythm where, you know, you, 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 size the release bigger than what you actually had the ability to deliver you or you you know uh, came upon some unexpected problems uh and then you keep moving that release to the right it really erodes confidence and i think if you manage the expectation with people that we're going to lock the date if the if, and and we're going to target to have 100 120 percent of the scope in the release that we think we can actually deliver because we don't know which stuff's going to fall out but we know something's going to fall out you start to train the organization to understand that we're going live on this date. We're going live with the content that's ready. And then we're going to continue to mature that. And what we go live with is going to have meaningful value on day one, which is why we're going to go live. We're not going to wait for all this other stuff to catch up. That's a very different mindset how, and from how a lot of companies pursue it. And, you know, I started with that kind of big bang approach and I've moved into this, this more agile approach. So I think those are, those would be kind of the, the, the key tips, um, I'm still working on that uh, presentation for project control. So I'll, I haven't selected the fifth tip yet, but <laughs> I think those are the, the the first four. That's perfect. And you've mentioned that you're going to be talking at the Project Controls Expo. So if anyone would like to reach out to you, where would be best to do this? And is there any events upcoming that you may be speaking at that you'd like people to come and learn more about the conversation that we had today? Well, I think project controls is the next one for for me, but certainly, you know, invite you to reach out on on LinkedIn. I'm fairly active there, um, you know, building a community of, um, you know, uh, people who have been doing this. I've, I've been involved in the past in digital product creation consortiums with, you know, multiple other companies. I think that there's a lot that we can learn together. Those of us who are driving transformation recognize how challenging it is to do that. Um, in, and it's not getting any easier in our, you know, sort of current environment. So i um, always open to a good conversation uh, on, on you know, the, the, the best practices on how to drive this. Like I said, I've, I've got experience in fast moving consumer goods, B2C, software industrial, B2B, you know, and across now uh, a products business, uh, software business, and a projects business. So like, you know, three of probably six or seven kind of core business models that are out there. So having 10 services yet, that's probably next um, that, that I'll start to wade into. But kind of seeing how these things play out across there, I think you know, it gives me a good, well-rounded view of, uh, of, of this question of how you drive transformation. That's fantastic. And I'll make sure to put a link to your LinkedIn profile on uh, our show notes. And Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. I truly enjoyed it. You shared some fantastic tips and insights, and we'd love to have you again on the podcast in the future. Yeah, I'd love to be back. I, I like I say, I enjoy talking. It's a, it's a topic I'm very passionate about. I think, as you can you can see, hopefully <laughs> in the in the in the talk today, I think it's a very important topic because I, I really believe that 
you know, companies that invest in transformation and, and, and becoming better, oper- you know, operating better, becoming better at driving and optimizing their businesses will come out of the challenges that we're facing right now and will outpace their peers, right? So it, it, it's sometimes challenging to continue to invest in transformation during these times. I'm fortunate to be part of a company that, um, you know, Honeywell very much believes in that all the way up through, you know, our senior leadership, our C- CEO and CFO are really driving this personally. Uh, and and so that's, it's inspiring to work for a company uh, like that. I'm, I'm convinced that it's going to enable us to outperform our peers coming out of the, all the, this um, uh, challenges, the external challenges as they begin to abate um, really will drive that business performance. So happy to continue the conversation in uh, many different forms. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric.